Well, good morning, church family. Glad you've joined us from wherever you're at this morning as we seek together to worship God. Uh, if you're new to the Veritas family, really glad you've joined with us. We'd love to get to know you. You can follow the prompts on the screen uh, to fill out a connect card. Uh, that enables us to, to contact you to, let, uh, to answer any questions you might have about the church, about what it means to follow Jesus, and uh, gives us an opportunity to get to know you. So we'd love to have you fill that out some point this morning. Um, Psalm 118, friends, tells us that Today, here, this day is a day that the Lord has made and that we, and he calls us to rejoice and be glad in it. And this is true yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And our weekly gatherings, even these virtual gatherings, right, they, they serve to awaken in us again and again an understanding, an awareness, a, a view of God's glory, a, a view of God's grace that is still at work in us and around us, even when we're in the dark valleys, even when we're unsure of where he's at, even when we're unsure of what the situations and circumstances around us. Today is a day that God has made, and it's an opportunity for us to know his kindness, his glory, to delight in him. And the songs and liturgies and prayers and scriptures that we're about to go through lead us to orient our hearts around these good things from God, his glory, his grace, his truth. And so we ask at the beginning of our gatherings, we ask, Holy Spirit, come lead us to worship God. Jesus, lead us to, to the waters of your streams of grace, to be refreshed in your streams of grace. Uh, Father God, lead us to your glory. Show us your presence, your love, that we might worship you. So friends, join with me as we sing and worship the Lord this morning. Bring your burdens, your requests, your needs to him. He is a God of comfort and care. Praise the Lord, for he is worthy to, re to be praised. Rejoice and be glad, for today is a day that the Lord has made. He has saved us and redeemed us and is leading us to know him more and more. fortress is our God a bulwark never failing our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing for still ancient foe doth seek to Work us woe, his path and power are great, and on with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Oh, oh, oh. If we in all strength confine, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. And you ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is He, the Lord of hosts, His names, from age to age the same. And He must win the battle. Oh. This world with devils filled should threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God hath will His truth to triumph through us. And though this 
read this call to worship together with thankful hearts, lifting up our praise to God, remembering all that he has done and all that he continues to do for us. So read the underlying portions with me. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Let us extol you, our God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day we will bless you and praise you forever and ever. Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. Your greatness is unsearchable.
based on Psalm 22, which is a psalm written by King David in the midst of trial and struggle and despair. It's a cry of lament when he was despised by the people and surrounded by his enemies. It's a psalm that actually points us toward that great cry of lament of Jesus on the cross. And yet what's amazing about this psalm is that even in his despair, David remembers the faithfulness of God. David reflects on God's promises and he finds hope in God's grace for his people, which is exactly what we see Jesus fulfill on the cross. When even in the greatest act of evil that's ever been done, good and grace overflow for God's people. Friends, it's at times like this that, that we can feel so beat down and discouraged when we can think that, that, that all is lost because we're just weak and weary. But hear this. God is near. God is faithful. And we need to remember his promises and find hope in his grace. So let's take a moment now to come before the Lord, confessing our sin, lifting up anything that leaves us beat down and weary and worried, and find our hope in the promises and grace of God. Take a moment to pray silently before the Lord. Father, we thank you that even in the midst of our struggle, you are near to us. You are our provision, our refuge, and our strength. We thank you for your faithfulness, your grace, and your love toward us. Amen. Let's read together this, this assurance based on Psalm 22. We will proclaim your name to our brothers and sisters. We will praise you among your people. Praise the Lord, all you who fear him. Honor him, all you descendants of Jacob, for he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He has not turned his back on them, but has listened to their cries for help. From you, O Lord, comes our theme of praise in the great assembly. The poor will eat and be satisfied. All who seek the Lord will praise him. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. So as we sing this next song, let's remember the promises of God and let's find assurance in his faithfulness and grace.
to God for the peace that we have in Christ our Savior. We're going to spend a few minutes now connecting with one another as we share in that peace and we share in that joy by texting someone from your church family. Let them know you're thinking about them. Send them a picture. Remind them what you look like. Uh, If you're joining us for the first time, we want you to know how honored we are to have you with us this morning. We'd like to extend a warm welcome to you and we'd love to get to know you. So take a few minutes Um, follow the prompts on your screen. That'll take you to um, some ways that you can let us know a little bit about yourself. We'll be eager to connect with you and we'll follow up soon. Okay, take out those phones and spend a few minutes passing the peace.
Good morning, church. Our text today comes from Psalm 27. Follow along in your Bible or on the screen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an enemy encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now... My head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, Seek my face. My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you have, who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. One of the most difficult words to learn uh, to practice in life is the word wait. Um, You think about the young child who is told to wait their turn and in an instant, they become a raging Tasmanian devil. Or the young, uh, the young teen uh, who is learning to wait for the next season of life. Uh, like they just want to be old enough to go to the movies by themselves, to get a cell phone. They want to be old enough to drive. Uh, the adolescent years of waiting can be very frustrating. We go as adults to a restaurant and the same uh, emotions of frustration and even rage uh, can begin to surface in some of the most respectable and mature adults uh, when we're told to wait. You know, it's almost comical to watch adults wait for a table at a restaurant. Like they they look out across the restaurant and uh, they see all the empty tables and uh, why can't I sit in that one? Why didn't they staff more ser- servers today? Um, like, didn't that couple come in before us? Didn't that party arrive uh, after us, uh, rather? And if this is an indication of the quality, I'm sure we're in for a terrible night. I'm sure the food's going to be cold and the chicken's going to be dry. Before they even sat down, they become frustrated. And nowadays you go into a store and there's little marks all over the store to- telling you to wait right here in this spot. Uh, until it's your turn to move another six feet, and then you have to wait in another spot. Uh, Watch people at these little stations next time you go into a store. Uh, It's kind of funny because these these grown adults inch forward past their spot uh, in this moment by moment, they inch forward just thinking this is an impossible situation to stand right here and wait in this spot. Now, as I've interacted with people over the last couple of months, Um, Every person seems to be waiting right now. Uh, But the waiting is a vastly different experience for everybody. Because from one person to the next, everybody is waiting for something different. We're all longing for something, but it's different. We're waiting for something to return into our life, to give us some sense of normalcy, but it's always different. Uh, Maybe you're waiting for schools to reopen or daycares to reopen. Uh, Maybe you're longing for stores and restaurants to be at full capacity. Maybe you're simply waiting for life to be done with masks and social distancing. 
I'm guessing many of you are like me, and in these moments of waiting, uh, you begin to uh, notice that these emotions of fear and frustration have really started to rise up within you. Anxiety and anger as you wait for your job to reopen, your kid's school or daycare, your favorite restaurants or sporting events, or even as simple as your favorite playground to take your children, whatever it is. Even the most introverted among us are starting to feel distress and displeasure because uh, they're waiting for handshakes and hugs to reopen. Maybe you've cried out internally or maybe even externally, uh, when will life go back to normal? In today's psalm, David is experiencing uh, a very difficult season of life. He's being hunted. It would seem that he's being pursued by enemies. Maybe Saul, we don't really know what's going on in this psalm, what it's a response to, but during this time of unrest, he gives us a timely direction for those of us who are waiting in the midst of preparing for, or even in the midst of very real and scary threats. If you're like me, when you heard this psalm read uh, by Mark for the first time, maybe uh, you might be discouraged. Uh, What I mean is David is literally being surrounded by enemies, literally being hunted. He's constantly on the move. His life is always being threatened, it seems. And even in the face of that, his life just seems to ooze with confidence. Listen to some of his words as we begin here. In verse 1, the Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. Right? Do you hear this? Like, though a virus arises, though racism encamps around us, though the economy is volatile right now, yet I will be confident. Is that what you hear right now? Verse six, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in this tent, his tent, sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. How many of us, when we uh, start to feel the pressure and realize that this virus and the effects of it are surrounding us, how many of us are singing shouts of joy, making melody of praise to the Lord? And he even ends with this strong and courageous call, wait for the Lord. Verse 14, be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Does this psalm describe your posture of your heart these past two months or even this last week? Like David, are you fearless, confident, strong, and courageous in the face of your fears and frustrations? Some of you are, and I praise God for you. Some of you have faced great trials and pain and suffering in your life. And through that, you have experienced the goodness and faithfulness of God. During those valleys of shadow of death, you are like a shining, you are shining bright, God's light and goodness to the world around you because of the courage and confidence that you have in the Lord. People are freaking out and losing their minds all around you, but your confident posture in Christ, in God, is both evangelistic and worshipful. But for some of us, this might be the first major crisis you've ever really experienced in your life, that you've ever had to deal with, and you're panicking. Fear and anxiety are starting to rule in your heart, and you don't know what to do about it. You hear David's words and you think, yes, I want that. I want that kind of courage and confidence. Just tell me what I have to do and I'll do it. But what we will see is that David is not giving us a religious formula to figure out how to get out of trouble. Rather, he is declaring good news. He's declaring a gospel message to us to give us that confidence and courage through times of trouble. He's saying in times when your life is threatened and it seems that you are all alone, you don't have to wait for things to get better. Don't put your hope on life improving or things going back to normal. Rather, believe who God is 
Delight in his presence with you. Put your faith in his promises. When Jesus is all that we desire, he becomes all that you need. And when he becomes the one thing that you need, the fears and frustrations of losing everything else in this world greatly diminish. So today I want to look at a few practical ways that Jesus becomes the one thing in our life that can remove all fears. Again, this isn't a formula uh, that David is prescribing for fear. Uh, It's not a band-aid that we put on our anxiety, uh, but he is describing good news to be believed. And by putting our faith in God, by desiring, delighting, and searching for his presence and following his word, we too can face our fears with great courage. We don't have to wait for things to get better. Because in Christ, we have more than we ever deserve and all that we ever need. You see, when the things we want most in this life are threatened, uh, we experience uh, are threatened. We experience fear and frustration because they're temporary. But when we desire him above all else, the fears diminish because God is eternal. He is always present and he is sovereign. Threats against his throne uh, seem entirely empty. In this psalm, David gives us characteristics of our waiting, how we should wait, that give us strength in our faith, that give us courage to face our fear and frustration. To wait for the Lord then and face our fears with courage He says we first must believe the character of God. We must have a proper theology and understanding of who God is and trust that. Psalm 27, 1 begins, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? David opens by saying, The Lord is my light. The Lord is holy. He is true. He is all-knowing. Uh, To say that the Lord is light is a gospel declaration right from the beginning of this psalm. This is good news about who he is and who we are not. To get a clearer picture of uh, this symbol, we we turn to 1 John. 1 John 1, 5 uh, and 6 says, This is the message we have heard from him. And we proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we have fellowship with him, While we walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not practice the truth. You see, before Christ, we all walked in darkness. Our life was marked by sin and darkness. To be more specific, uh, the Bible tells us that we were dead in our sin. And for those sitting in sin, uh, exposure to light, exposure to the truth of the glory of God can be embarrassing and shameful moment against the blazing beauty and holiness and majesty of God's light. Our sin is horrifying. It is evil and tragically dreadful. It leads to death. And like the dark night of the sky that flees from the sunrise, breaking over the horizon, our sin cannot exist in the presence of God's holiness. If our sin is categorically dark and he is characteristically light, we know that these two things cannot exist together. So to say that he is my light is to say that I have been fundamentally changed. I have a new nature. If our sin is darkness and darkness cannot exist with the light of his holiness, something had to change within David. Something had to change within us and then our nature to allow us to stand firm in his light and to sit and behold his beauty in his presence. This is why he immediately says, after the Lord is my light, he is my salvation. When we have a proper understanding of God's character, that he is perfect, then our only hope is this second truth, that he is also loving, gracious, caring. He executes perfect justice, but he provides loving kindness and mercy at the same time. He is our light. He is our salvation. 
When he, when we see that he has moved us from that realm of darkness into the realm of his kingdom of marvelous light, we begin to see that we don't have to fear anything in this world because he is all powerful and all knowing. So when we come face to face with his character, with that blazing light of truth and holiness, we don't have to shrink back and conceal our, our sin or deny or diminish it anymore. Verse 7 in 1 John 1 says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we acknowledge it, confess it, repent from it, and walk in the light because Jesus' sacrifice covers us, he has made us clean through his sacrifice, we are set free. We can have fellowship with God. We can have peace with God. We can enter his presence and have peace with him and each other. Life is fleeting. We are more aware of this than ever before. But we can, in Christ, we can have forgiveness of sin now. We can have peace with God and each other now and a hope for the future. If God is my light and salvation from sin and death if we do not have to fear the horrors of hell, what do I have to be afraid of in this life? What can be more worse? What can be worse than eternal punishment? What can be more tragic than eternal separation from God? But God, through David's word, wants us to know that although he cares about that eternal destiny, although he cares about that future, he also cares deeply about your experience now, your existence here. He also cares about the existence and cares about the experiences of other people in this world. So to round out this first verse, he, he brings it into our physical existence here and now. He says, David, uh, the Lord is also my stronghold of my life. He is my refuge, my protector, my comfort. Whom shall I be afraid? He doesn't just ignore or diminish the threats that he is actually feeling, the fears that are actually coming before him. He faces them head on. Verse two, when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, when my adversary, adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war arise against me, yet I will be confident. And jumping down to verse 10, he says, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. In this world, though all may abandon, in this world we can experience his presence and the comfort that that gives us here and now. I love this. Uh, this is not just a formula to prevent evil from coming into our life. There really isn't this moment that we can pinpoint in David's life where his, his parents forsake him. So it's almost like he's, he's playing on this worst case scenario uh, approach uh, where he's just testing out potential problems. He doesn't try this meditative practice to only focus on the good things in life or deny the bad that happens in his life. He's so confident in the goodness and faithfulness of God and the worth of God that he's even able to create hypothetical situations, scenarios where he can test out this, this truth. Now, I'm not suggesting you spend a lot of time uh, creating and meditating on hypotheticals, uh, which life is in danger, when your life is in danger. But what hope for those who do go there when you are most afraid and you're, you're afraid of fear. David's courageous faith was not hypothetical only. It was field tested. He was, he was on the run as a fugitive. We know this. He did not always live a comfortable and easy life. These aren't the empty platitudes of a man just relaxing in his castle. These are the cries of a man who have experienced the goodness of God in the face of great danger. David says, I don't have to be afraid. I can be confident, strong, and courageous, not in my own success, not in my own strength. I am a success. He was a successful warrior, not in my own wisdom as a king, 
but in the Lord and who he is, his character. He is my light. He is my salvation. He is the stronghold, my refuge. When we believe and we trust the character of God, we see that he is all that we need. When he becomes the one thing, the only thing that we need, fear and frustration of losing everything else in this world fades away. You see, when the things we want most in this life are threatened, we experience fear and frustration because they're temporary. But when we desire him above all else, our fears will fall away because God is eternal. There is no threat to who he is. So to wait for the Lord uh, to face fears with courage, we must first believe the character of God, who he is. But next, we must desire his presence. We must desire the presence of God in our life. Let's look at verse four, and we will see this focused purpose of the psalmist. One thing, one thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and acquire in his temple. In the face of surrounding enemies uh, trying to kill him or the threat of being forsaken by his parents, we might ex expect David to say something like, uh, the one thing I want is to be set free. I don't want to be hunted anymore. I don't want to be chased by evil men anymore. I just want to go to my house. I want to simply rest for a while. Even going back to, the, to my father's uh, pastures and watching the sheep would be better than this right now. There's a thousand things that we think David could have said in this moment, what he wanted. But he doesn't get distracted by the temporary, as painful and as frightful as it is. He sets his mind on eternity, on the glory and beauty of Christ. There's so many fears and frustrations in waiting. They're trying to distract us from the character of God and who he says he is, his goodness and his steadfast love. There's so many things trying to get us to doubt him and stop believing in who he is and trusting his promises. I remember last week as Pastor Joe was going through Psalm 23, uh, he opened up with verse one. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And I, and I remember thinking as he read that and as I reflected on that, I shall not want. I shall not want. But I do want. I want disease. I want this disease to end. I want this virus to just disappear off the face of the earth. But day by day, it seems to care less and less about what I want. I want marriages to come out of this season uh, radiant and flourishing, but time after time I am hearing that they have become dull or worse, crumbling. I want justice to be fairly given to young black men, but racism seems to be growing stronger and more violent. I want lonely people to feel loved, supported, and cared for, but news of isolated people feeling hopeless to the point of despair just floods my news feed. I want addiction to end its violent campaign on our society, but day after day it slaughters our friends and family and neighbors. I want families to be strong and unified, but parents aren't leading their children, and children young and old are rebelling. Every one of these things that I want, these are affecting real people, real families and couples with real faces and names, many of whom have come into my life in these experiences this very week. These are hypothetical scenarios. We live in a world that is plagued by darkness and deceit and death. We work hard to fight against these injustices and suffering and hopelessness that many of us are feeling. But as we look at this psalm, 
All these things that we want. David continues to give us focus on what and who God is. And our desire to be, to look to him. He gives us direction on how we can seek his face. And how our fears and our frustrations and wants can be faced with courage and strength because of who God is. And what he is doing in all of these situations for his glory. So after opening up the psalm, uh, describing the character of God, uh, in light of who God is, no matter what trouble comes into our life, we can be sure that he is good and in his presence is life. Therefore, I seek after his presence. I desire to dwell in his house forever and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Why can I face fear and frustration uh, with courage and strength, gazing upon his beauty, on the beauty of God? Because unlike the beauty of a fleeting rainbow, as magnificent as it is, or the beauty of a famous painting, no, no matter how magnificent it is, uh, these things are but here for a moment and they are gone. But the beauty of the Lord, the delight, the peace and satisfaction we have and we gain from his divine presence is unending. To gaze upon that kind of eternal beauty satisfies our longing hearts like nothing else can. Uh, Tim Keller says uh, that this gazing is not a one-time glimpse, but it is a steady, sustained focus it's not a petitionary prayer, but praising and admiring, enjoying God just for who he is. He said, David finds God beautiful, not just useful for attaining good. To sense God's beauty in the heart is to have such pleasure in him that you rest content. You see, we never stop gazing. We never stop looking around and having that sustained focus. Uh, someone else said that we never stop worshiping. Fear and frustration uh, can be healthy when it leads us uh, to change course, to address injustice, combat sin, uh, but can also help us identify when we are lingering, when we are longing on things that are less than God. When something other than Christ becomes our steady gaze, we must ask the Lord, as David says, he asked the Lord, it is only by his grace that we can gaze upon the Lord continually and find strength and courage in times of fear and frustration. We must cry out to him like David does here, asking him to reveal himself. And this is such good news. Because if we cry out to him, he promises to show himself. He is present with us. If Jesus is Lord of our life, he promises that he is with us in times of trouble. This promise does not, is not a promise to take you out of trouble. We know this. But his presence is comfort and hope in times of trouble. Listen to David, verse 5. For he will hide me in his shelter. In the day of trouble, he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon the rock. I love this verse because David knew that there was a special blessing and protection for those who earnestly sought, seek God. Listen, this was not a promise to, uh, for, for safety, for all trouble, but to give us this security and blessing even in the midst of it. It reminds me of when a uh, young Susan discovers that Aslan is in fact a lion uh, in the Lion, the Witch, in the Wardrobe. She says, I thought that he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous meeting a lion. And Mr. Beaver responds, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. I'm certainly not going to tell you how Aslan the lion uh, proves his goodness and justice and rightness and love for the young children, uh, but I will say that it's a wonderful display of Christ's sacrificial love for the church 
And if you've never read it or watched the movie, I encourage you to do it. Uh, but Jesus also gives us a reminder of the security and blessing that we have uh, by telling his disciples at the end of his great commission in Matthew 28, verse 20, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I'm sending you to make disciples of all nations, but I am with you always to the end of the age. He says, I'm not sending you into a safe world, but I am good and I will be with you. My presence goes with you. When he says, you must declare and demonstrate that my goodness and teach others all that I have commanded you, what he's implying is that these would-be disciples that you're going to make are part of a world that is living in darkness. They have not yet received the light. They do not yet know this truth. You have to teach them because they don't know. So you're not going into safe places to declare the gospel of Jesus, but you're going to embark through places where fear and frustration are reigning. But as you go, church, we remember his character. We delight in his presence and we desire his presence because he is not safe. It is not a safe world, but he is good. Jesus invaded this world with his grace and he is with us. He is for us. And thanks be to God that the hope we have by his presence is more than just a five steps, five step program to a less fearful life. Our hope rests not on a formula or this program, but on a good, loving, gracious, merciful, and loving presence of Jesus Christ with us. Although it's not a formula, David does give us some practical ways that help us believe the character of God and delight in his presence in this psalm. Practical discipleship principles on how we can navigate fearful and frustrating times with strength and courage. First, he says, he comes to the Lord in prayer with complete honesty. He says, hear, O Lord, when I cry, be gracious to me, answer me. You said, seek my face, and my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. The Lord says to seek him, to come to him, to respond in faith, to believe who he says he is and to delight in his presence alone. And when he becomes the sole object, the only thing that we desire, we don't have to fear losing any earthly joy because our eternal joy is secure in Christ Jesus. We have a personal, intimate relationship with a holy, all-powerful, all-knowing and gracious and merciful God. When we take hold of that reality, when we truly believe it and recognize who God is, that he wants to be intimately known, we can approach him with unrestrained emotion and unfiltered thoughts, with complete honesty and transparency because we know that we do not, rather we cannot impress him or change our relationship with him. It is secure. He says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me all who, are, who labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Seek him. It is not difficult. He invites us to come. He's ready to give your tired soul rest. And when we experience the forgiveness of God and the acceptance on Christ's behalf, uh, on our, that Christ gives us on our behalf, a peace comes over us that we cannot explain. You can only experience it. But I like what Jesus says in the next verse, in verse 29 of Matthew 11. My yoke be upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Though we don't need to impress him or earn his favor to gain that rest in Christ, we are fully and freely accepted by God the Father. He invites us into this life of learning, this, this relationship, a life of discipleship. We aren't there yet, he says. It's a life of purpose here and now to know him more. We come to him in prayer with complete honesty. But the second thing we see here by Jesus' words and then in David as well in Psalm 27, that he desires and delights in the Lord's presence but he also desires to learn from him, to gain wisdom, 
understanding in his ways of righteousness, he says in verse 11, teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me on the level path because of my enemies. So many of us want to live our own way. And that way of thinking is reinforced even more by our culture. As David trusts the character of God, as he seeks the face of God in his presence, and he delights in his presence, he understands that God is light in his salvation. And to, to follow him then is the direction that he wants to go. He wants to learn his ways. He knows it's not the safest path. Look at verse 12. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me. They breathe out violence. This isn't safe. It's not the safest path, but it's level. It is reliable. It is steady and sure. The path may go through deep valleys of shadows of death at times, and it may take us through mountaintop experiences in other moments. But where it leads is life. David says, teach me your ways. I need you to reveal this to me. Lead me on your path. Where you are leading is the place I want to be. Look at verse 13 as we close. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. When everything else in our world is pointing to death, deceit, destruction, when life seems dark and volatile, David says, I believe in who God is. He is my light and salvation. In the face of of enemies, he is, the stay, he is the sure and steady path. The presence of darkness does not change his character or his presence with me. When darkness veils his lovely face, we remember that we can rest on his unchanging grace. Father, we are so grateful for who you are. Father, you have revealed yourself to us in magnificent life and beauty and glory. You are truth. And we can only know that because you revealed it to us, you are our light. You are holy, real, righteous, and true. And Father, I pray that we would walk in that light that you have invited us into. Father, that you would transform our lives to reflect that light and beauty to this world around us. Father, you are our salvation. Father, we, as we wait in this life, as we wait when fears and danger surround us, Father, we pray that we would be constantly reminded that you are our salvation. You are our refuge and stronghold in times of trouble, that you are all worthy of our praise. Father, we seek after you. Show yourself to us that we might follow you. Father, we thank you for your word and illuminating this truth to us this morning. Father, we praise you for who you are, your unchanging character, your love for us. Father, we can't believe. It is so hard to just wrap our minds around the unbelievable love that you have given us and demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we worship you this morning. We praise you for the beauty of Jesus Christ and the change that he has given us in transferring us from darkness to light. And so we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name.
Please read the underlying portions of this prayer of commitment with me. Lord, you are our light and our salvation, the very stronghold of our lives. We depend on you because you are everything we need. Lord, we fix our eyes on you. Help us to look to you and your word in the midst of fear and anxiety and help us to give these things over to you, resting in your provision and care. Jesus, from your first breath to your last, you kept the law for us so that we could be freed from its curse. You have been patient for us. Father, now be patient with us. May your unfailing love rest upon us. Help us to grow into people who put their hope in you and wait for you with glad hearts. When the time is right, you will come again to make all things new. Help us to wait submissively for the fullness of our salvation and rejoice in the salvation that you give us every day. Amen. Whoa!
Amen. The Lord is our hope and our salvation, and we have rest in Him. I'm thankful to still be able to gather with all of you on Sundays, even from our homes, to be reminded to lift our eyes and hearts to the Lord. If you're new here with us, I would invite you, if you haven't already, to follow the prompts on the screen to get connected with us. Hear this benediction as an encouragement for our week as we go from here today. Let us go from here praising God for the hope that we have in Jesus, who died but is risen and rules over all, and through his Spirit is present with us. Because he lives, we look forward to eternal life, knowing that nothing past, present, or yet to come can separate us from his great love made known in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Peace be with you.